Hello, book two, and welcome to our uh, read-along of Frank Herbert's Dune. <laughs> this is the first installment of Dune Tube 2019, a read-along that I'm doing with a bunch of other booktubers, where we read each one of Frank Herbert's Dune novels, one a month, between July and December. And the only uh, wrinkle in the, in the program that we're doing here is that I'm doing an actual read-along of the books week by week instead of just one video. I would kill me if I had to do one video of Frank Herbert's Dune. So, we have been reading along, and the, the unlike a lot of the things that we do in our read-alongs, the novel itself doesn't really help with partitions, with way stations to help us along. So I've just been going by a rough page count, uh, and the uh, the rough page count on, in this this beautiful Ace paperback, uh, the, these all the Dune novels have been reissued in these Ace paperbacks, uh, we start the read-along today with uh, a chapter that starts, They approached Cave of Ridges at dawn break, moving through a split in the basin wall so narrow they had to turn sideways to negotiate it. Uh, in this edition, that's page 466. Uh, and in this edition, we're reading today until page 650. Uh, so that brings us all the way to uh, a chapter titled, Paul waited on the sand outside the gigantic maker's line of approach. I must not wait like a smuggler, impatient and jittering, he reminded himself. I must be part of the desert. Uh, and between those two segments is, are, is the, the, are the pages that we're reading today. And the pages that we're reading today are aftermath. They are, that is their central theme, bitter aftermath. As you saw in the earlier uh, installments that we read, uh, House Atreides in this far future uh, galactic empire is a, a well-respected and popular noble house uh, that has been ordered by the emperor of this of this imperium to leave its planet of Caladan, a water world, and move to Dune, move to Arrakis, the desert planet Dune. And the house, the the the, the house that rules Dune, the Harkonnens, have been ordered to vacate. There's a switch going on, and. Uh, the Atreides, unless they're willing to pack up the family goods and the family bombs and go renegade, they have to obey. They have no choice. So they go to Arrakis. They go to Dune. And Duke Leto, the leader of the family, uh, and his concubine, the Lady Jessica, who has been uh, trained by the Bene Gesserit, an order of extremely secretive women <laughs> with a, a gigantic uh, agenda of their own, <laughs> uh, who have grafted themselves, nevertheless, onto imperial power, not just because they have reverend mothers who can form, who can act as truth sayers. Complex machinery not being really all that accepted in the Imperium, uh, but also because the Bene Gesserit make great concubines and wives, uh, and that's just as well because the Bene Gesserit have a secret and extremely complicated breeding program of their own, designed to produce a male who has their psychic and physical powers and, and their ability to access uh, previous memories stored in their cellular, in, in their body cells. Uh, a male version of a Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother that they consider to be the Kwisatz Haderach, uh, this semi-mythical figure that they are constantly angling their breeding programs towards. Uh, Lady Jessica was ordered by the Bene Gesserit to give Duke Leto a daughter who would then have been had a, a male mate selected for her by the breeding program in the, in the constant aim of getting to the Kwisatz Haderach. Lady Jessica defied the order and gave the Duke a son, young Paul, because she loved him. Uh, and that has thrown things that has thrown the, the, the sisterhood's breeding program into a little bit of chaos. But it's nothing compared to the chaos that accompanies the change of holdings. Because the, the Harkonnens hate the Atreides, and the Atreides hate the Harkonnens. And there is an imperial judge of the change, uh, a planetologist uh, named Dr. Kynes, who is allegedly supposed to be overseeing to make sure all the forms are upkept, and that there's no skullduggery, that there's no treachery, that the change of one ruling house to another happens smoothly and in an orderly fashion. Uh, but Kynes has been ordered by the Emperor, we learn fairly early on, long before we get to the chapters we're reading today, uh, to turn a blind eye to a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, we also learn that there's a traitor in the Atreides camp, uh, the, the family doctor, Dr. Yua, 
has imperial conditioning, sook conditioning, which is supposed to be unbreakable. It's supposed to mean that anyone can trust him to minister to them without betraying them. He's been conditioned not to be suborn. But uh, Baron Harkonnen has found a way that deals with his love of his captured wife. Dr. Hewitt is not a fool. He's fairly certain that he cannot save his wife. The plan that has evolved in his mind is not so much to save his wife as to kill the Baron. And for this, he needs to get close enough, and the Baron's men will not allow that. But he knows that if he helps the Baron to overturn, to betray the Atreides family and bring them down, the Baron will want to get Duke Leto Atreides close enough to him to gloat over him. And that's close enough for murder. And Dr. Ewa paralyzes the Duke at the, at the very moment of his betrayal and replaces one of his teeth with a, fel, a false tooth filled with poison and tells the semi-conscious Duke, when the time comes, when the Baron is leaning over you, bite down on this tooth. You are the vessel of my revenge, and in exchange for you doing what I want, I will save Jessica and the boy. And the Duke agrees. As not much of a choice. <laughs> and, uh, but the Baron barely survives. The, the, the Duke when the time comes, bites down on the tooth, exhales a cloud of poison, of course killing him, but killing everyone else in the room. The Baron barely escapes, but his Mentat is killed by the poison. Mentats are extremely rare and valuable people who have been trained to function as supercomputers. Because supercomputers themselves, and especially something that we would now call AI, artificial intelligence, have been strictly forbidden for centuries in the Imperium. Thou shalt not make a computer in the guise of a man. That they, You cannot have them. This is a world without them. And the, what, what takes their place are mentats, and everyone who's anyone has a mentat, and they're rare and hard to come by. And uh, the, So, of course, the Baron is upset that he's lost his mentat. Uh, but he is alive, and uh, we ended our last chunk of chapters with the Baron triumphant. There's no other way to put it. The bad guys, triumphant. And it, it quickly becomes apparent that the Baron had lots of help. <laughs> Not only did he spend an obscene amount of money, ten, a hundred times more money, than Duke Leto's own Mentat, Thufir Hawat, ever estimated that he would. Not only that, but he also had help from the Emperor, who was jealous of the popularity of Duke Atreides, and therefore sent legions of his own special hardened super soldiers, the Sardaukar, disguised in Harkonnen livery, disguised as Harkonnen soldiers, so that no one would be able to point and say, oh, look, the emperor is helping to overthrow a royal house. That, that wouldn't be possible, but it would still happen. That quickly becomes apparent, and in these chapters that we're reading today, these chapters are exclusively dealing with aftermath, with bitter aftermath. As slowly but surely, Dufir Hawat, for instance, was in a, a, a far distant village encampment and therefore temporarily survives the destruction of, of Arakeen, the destruction of the Atreides base, the destruction of most of the Atreides men. He temporarily survives with a band of Fremen, who are the wild, these wild sand dwellers of Dune, who are hunted for sport by the Harkonnen and always have been, and who are dismissed by Baron Harkonnen as you know, a, not a leaderless rabble. We start to know different. The planetologist Kynes has an identity among the Fremen as Liet Kynes, a, a kind of a prophet who has a vision for Dune that doesn't have anything to do with mining the spice melange, which is the, the source of the power of the Bene Gesserit, the source of the power of space flight, and an extremely addictive substance that lengthens life uh, and that is only found on Dune. That is the only concern of, uh, of someone like the Harkonnens, uh, and also the only thing that most of the Imperium thinks about when they think of Dune. They think spice and enormous sandworms, bigger than space freighters, these creatures that live in the open desert, these sandworms who, uh, again, we don't know how many there are, and we, don't know, we, don't, we only know that it's absolute death to be out on the sands because they'll, they'll, they can consume whole factories. Uh, the uh, the planetologist we saw in our last group of chapters 
knows what his duty is. He knows what he's going to do. He knows something of the plan that's going to take place, but he can't help it. He starts to like the Atreides. He meets them. He meets the Duke. He meets young Paul, and he starts to like them. And so, in the chapters that we're reading today, when aftermath happens, these are all in the aftermath. Thufir Hawat briefly con uh, consorts with Fremen, who, uh, <laughs> who stun him by mentioning that, that there's, of course, the planet has been in absolute chaos since the shields went down and all of these invading uh, troop carriers landed. There's been fighting everywhere. And when the Fremen who are with Thufir Hawad in the chapters that we're reading today mentioned that some of the soldiers dressed as Harkonnen actually fought well, Hawad is stunned because he gradually realizes in the course of that conversation that the Fremen are talking about rather casually killing Sadarkar. They are an even fiercer fighting force than the super soldiers on which the Emperor's authority rests. <laughs> uh, that's, that's stunning. To Hawat, he doesn't have long to savor it before he himself is captured uh, by the Harkonnen. Uh, and at the same time, we learn that Paul and Jessica are thriving. They, they, Dr. Ewell was as good as his word. They, they have barely survived. They are making their way along in the desert. Uh, they are briefly taken in by Dr. Kynes, uh, who tells them a little bit more about what's going on and, and, uh, because... They're in, they're in a moment of safety, guarded by Kynes' Fremen, and also by Duncan Idaho, the expert swordsman, who also survived. It turns out that most of Duke Leto's high commandos survived, in one way or another. Paul and Jessica, certainly. Uh, Gurney Halleck, the swordsman and songster, survives among the, the, the smugglers. Uh, Thufir Hawa survives briefly among the Fremen, and then he's captured alive by the Harkonnen. And also Duncan Idaho survives at least for now, I don't want to give anything away, but we are not in any way done with the character of Duncan Ido. But in the chapters that we're reading today, while Jessica and Paul are talking with Liet Kynes, they hear, you know, a, con a commotion outside. They open the door briefly and see that they have been found, and that uh, Idaho and his men are vainly holding off a massive attack, and that Idaho looks badly wounded. They slam the door closed, leaving him to his death, and flee into the desert. Paul and Jessica do. Dr. Kynes is captured, and in one of the most moving chapters in the book, uh, the Harkonnens strip him of his garments, they strip him of the still suit that the Fremen used to, to conserve water in the open desert, and they abandon him in the desert. As a, a kind of brutal irony that this planetologist who believes in saving Dune and reclaiming it as a beautiful planet should be left to let the planet have its way. The planet kills Liet Kynes. That, that chapter, I, I'm more impressed by it the more I read it. it. It's, I think, another one. We mentioned last time that Frank Herbert has a talent for set pieces. He certainly does. Set, a set piece being a sort of a scene within a scene that has a dramatic arc of its own and that can any misstep can ruin it. I think that the, the small chapter where we, where we are inside Liet Kynes' head as he is wandering around on the sand, dying, is another one of those set pieces. I think it's really good. Another really good one. Uh, and we end our chapters today uh, just like that, in disarray. We, we have been looking, getting scattered glimpses of the survivors of this great treachery. And there are a few of them. Gurney Halleck, we see him make his peace with the smugglers. He and his men will, will live to fight another day with the smugglers. They're not happy about it, but they will do it. Thufir Hawat has been captured by the Harkonnen, and we see a scene in which Baron Harkonnen consults with his, his nephew, the Beast Raban, about how instead of just killing Thufir Hawat, who is you know, a, a master assassin, a mentat, and a, someone who has served three generations of Atreides, of course, the natural thing would be to kill him out of hand. He's too dangerous to be left alive. But the Baron thinks, well, no, I, I'm missing a mentat. I need a new one. I will just suborn this mentat. They're, they're, they're basically living computers. They only really care about the information you feed into them. I will, I will turn Thufir Hawat to my own devices. And we also see Paul and Jessica surviving in the open desert, surviving, running from worms, and eventually, as our chapters end this time around, encountering a band of Fremen, led by a person we've met before, back in in the brief peaceful interval when the Atreides were trying to establish a power base on Dune and thinking they would live there, not knowing that betrayal was coming their way, they met a Fremen leader named Stilgar. 
and Paul and Jessica meet Stilgar and his band of Fremen at night in the desert, and uh, it's a very tense and well done scene uh, in which Stilgar learns the hard way <laughs> what what the rest of the galaxy is going to learn in due time. But Stilgar learns the hard way that one of the things that the Bene Gesserit, one of their, their talents, in addition to the breeding program and an amazing amount of social and religious insight, one of their talents is mastery of their own bodies. Lady Jessica easily defeats Stilgar, easily, and holds him hostage with him as a shield in front of his other men. And Stilgar is not offended in any way. He's not struggling. He knows perfectly well that she could easily kill him. Uh, instead, he's angry with his with the men and women under his command because they seem to want to press forward and and kill this woman who has dared to lay hands on their leader and he's he's telling them can't you see she she is completely defeated an armed Fremen people we've already been told can easily defeat the Imperial Sardaukar any woman who can do that is worth preserving it's it's worth making an alliance with her and her son if she can do this and that's where we end things very tentative all around the Duke, of course, has gone. For the father, nothing. But all the rest of it, the, 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 there are scattered bits of Atreides strands now running everywhere, most of them outside of Baron Harkonnen's control. And that is uh, an observation that really came to me when I was reading these chapters again for this read-along. I was thinking, uh, this was botched. <laughs> the Baron Harkonnen, he, yes, he paid for everything himself, as he complains. It, it, the Emperor was perfectly willing to lend a couple of legions of Sardaukar to make sure that this happened. But he wasn't willing to pay for anything. The Baron paid for everything with, with a vast amount of money. And yes, he had been laying money aside for that, and yes, he was willing to do it. But you can't help but think, if he, his, his mentat had been crazy, a crazy drug addict, and the Baron himself is... Uh, not nearly as smart as he thinks he is. You can't help but think in the course of these pages. What would have happened if this, if this uh, coup, if this treachery, had been done completely correctly right from the beginning? There wouldn't have been any loose ends. There wouldn't have been any strands like this. And that, that well, of course, there wouldn't have been a novel either, or a whole series of novels. I just, I found it interesting. That's all. That, uh, and another sign of Herbert's, of Herbert's great writing that the flaws in the Baron's plan extend from the Baron's personality. He could not have made a different plan than the one that he does, the one that doesn't quite work. In fact, aside from killing Duke Leto, it almost completely fails. Jessica and Paul are, are considered to be killed by a storm. The, the Baron's men have seen them fly their aircraft directly into one of Dune's killer sandstorms, which can strip metal and certainly destroy humans, and they don't see any bodies, but they're sure that, that, that uh, Jessica and Paul must be dead. The Baron has obviously read his share of Marvel comic books and knows that if you don't see a body, they're not dead. <laughs> but also, Gurney Halleck is still alive. For a while, Duncan Idaho is still alive. Liet Kynes is still alive, even though uh, the Baron knows right from the beginning that he threw in his lot with the Atreides at the end. Uh, Dufir Hawa is still alive. And again, this is a function of the Baron's personality. It's a function of his arrogance. But the thing you do with someone like Thufir Hawad is kill him right away. He's too dangerous, but he's, he's left alive. And so on and so forth, uh, right down the line. So, so these chapters that we're reading today are complete disarray. It looks like the Baron has completely won, with the help of the Emperor. But uh, it isn't so. <laughs> there are all sorts of factors involved, and the most important one of them uh, doesn't seem it in these chapters right now at the moment but the most important one of those factors is Paul who right from the beginning even when his mother and he are in the open desert is talking not so much about survival as about revenge and in the chapters that we're reading today he at one point lays out a rough outline of the form that revenge will take uh, and it's to Jessica it's, it strikes his mother as extremely cold and a little bit scary uh and that's those those factors when it comes to Paul are only going to increase enormously in the next chapters that we're reading. So we're going to read on. We're going to read on to page six hundred and fifty in this Ace edition uh, to to the chapter Paul waited on the sand. That we'll read to right about there for next time, uh, and then uh, 
and then we will conclude. Then we have uh, from page 650 to page roughly 800 to end with. Does that mean we're going to go over? I may, uh, math is not my strong suit. I may have miscalculated. Uh, one way or another, we'll go, we'll go up to there. We'll go up to, uh, to page 650 for next time. Uh, and then we'll, we'll sprint to the end. So, is that right? Today is the 20th? Oh, that is right. Then we're going to we're gonna go over then just a bit. All right, well, uh, next weekend is our last weekend with Dune. Next weekend is the 27th. So that's our last weekend with Dune. So I guess maybe instead of going to page 650, if you just want to read to the end, we'll just deal with from here to the end next time. Uh, so that we can pick up with Dune Messiah right away. Although there'll be a lot of Dune to talk about in, in August. Uh, but anyway... Sorry for the mess with the numbers, but the book isn't helping any because it doesn't it doesn't have chapter numbers. That would have made things easy for a math illiterate such as myself. But so that's in, that's what we'll do next time. We will just finish up talking about Dune next weekend. Uh, but we'll we'll be talking about it plenty in August anyway. So let me know what you thought of of this. All of our heroes, almost all of our heroes, survive in one way or another. Uh, and except for Liet Kynes, who, who very noticeably dies, but he, he only lately become a hero. And we meet her, heroes to take his place, in, including Stilgar. So what did you make of all of this? Uh, if, especially if you're reading it for the first time. Were you on tenterhooks? Were you eager to know what happens next? I remember reading this for the first time, and, and uh, it was just breathless. Coincidentally enough, I read this for the first time in a very, very hot summer. Uh, and I just could not stop reading. I could not stop turning the pages to find out what happened next. Pure storytelling to find out what happened next and how it all comes together at the end. Uh, so we're going to wrap this up for now, and next time we will, we will finish up with Frank Herbert's Dune. Uh, so I'll, and between then and now, you'll have lots of videos from other people about this book, so you have lots of, of other stuff to, to think about. Uh, so we're going to wrap this up for now, and I'll see you next week as we finish up. Thank you, BookTube.